Okay, we are now live. Good morning, evening, afternoon, folks who are joining us. Welcome. We're so pleased to have you here with us. We're just giving it one minute or so to let folks in, making sure they've been able to find the space and find the link. Um, but as you are joining us, if you would like um, to introduce yourself, well, let me double check with my colleagues in terms of whether we have a chat function. Um, Mara or Laura, could you confirm that for me? I believe we do. So if folks want to try putting their names um, in the chat. Perfect. We do. I see it. Thank you all. Sorry, we are, I'm sure like you using this, um, the pathable system for CSW for the first time. So since we have a chat function, we would uh, love to welcome you to introduce yourself. Let us know where you're calling in from. My name is Bridget Burns and I use she, her pronouns. I'm based off of unceded Lenape territory um, or so-called Brooklyn. Um, and uh, I am the director of the Women's Environment and Development Organization. And we do is one of several groups that are part of the Action Coalition Feminist Action for Climate Justice. And we're really excited to introduce this Action Coalition to you today. Uh, and hopefully get you thinking about how the work that you do relates to the areas that we're thinking about under this action coalition. So again, while we're letting people in, please feel free to introduce yourself, um, where you're coming from, the organization that you're part of, or a group that you might be part of. We also would invite you to think about what feminist action for climate justice means to you. So that could be a word, or it could be an action, um, we would welcome you to also put that into the chat as well. And I'm just gonna take one second to try to introduce myself in the chat uh, to give folks some more time to come in. It wasn't an introduction, but at least I know where it is now on my iPad and I can, I can follow along as, the, as folks are introducing themselves. Thank you so much for sharing. It's wonderful to see so many folks on here from so many different places. And I think with that, um, I'm just checking and making sure we have our participants in. I think with that, we will get started then. So could I ask you to just move us to the next slide, Mara? Thank you. So as said, we do is one of a group of folks who make up the Action Coalition Feminist Action for Climate Justice. Some of the other co-leads of this Action Coalition are speakers with us today, but many of the speakers that we have with us today are actually partners, members of our network, and, and really folks who we know are leading across different areas in different ways on the types of actions and the types of solutions that we see as really centering, um, centering what feminist action for climate justice looks like. So we're really excited to, to spend the majority of this space, um, the, the majority of this time together, exploring the different ways and the different solutions that are working currently to center a human rights-based gender just approach to climate action. Um, we have, um, I'll go through the, the speakers when we get um, to their slides when they when they come in individually. Uh, so could you just go to the next slide, Mar? So today we're gonna frame the Feminist Action for Climate Justice Coalition. We're gonna give you a really brief introduction to our Action Coalition blueprint. Uh, and as said, we wanna showcase what different action areas and initiatives look like under this blueprint and then look ahead to the ways in which you can engage. And I'm sure, I'm hoping that by the end, 
we'll also have um, lots of questions for how you can engage, for what the next steps are, and also sharing opportunities for you to share the work and the initiatives that you are undertaking in your own communities, in your own countries. Next slide. So many of you might be very familiar with the Generation Equality Forum, but we don't want to assume that. Um, generation Equality is a, a moment in time, really, for uh, looking back on 25 years of implementation of the Beijing Platform for Action. And in order to look at look back at this, the legacy of the Beijing Platform for Action, to understand where progress has been made, but also to recognize that the world has changed, that while we have seen progress in certain areas, particularly around gender equality, there are many places where issues have not advanced, at least not at the, at the pace that we had hoped. I think that for many of you who are experiencing continued high rates of gender-based violence, who see quite clearly the impacts that this pandemic has had on gender inequalities and the roles um, that folks play in their households, in their communities, the access to rights and resources that people have, as well as the, the other crises that we are facing, um, the multiple forms of crises, a biodiversity crisis, a climate crisis, and of course the pandemic that we are all experiencing. And so generation equality really was thought thought about as an opportunity to, to, to see the, the spaces where progress is still needed and come up with a renewed blueprint for action connected to the Beijing platform for action that would give us the opportunity over a five-year period to advance specific goals. The Generation Equality Forum itself is being co-led by the governments of Mexico and France alongside UN Women and many civil society organiza organizations are engaged in different ways. Many sit on the decision-making body of the action areas and um, what the forum itself will look like. And then there are those such as we do and the other organizations in this action coalition that is trying to drive the framing of these, what are six action areas. Um, if you go, there is a, if you look up Generation Equality, there's a Generation Equality Forum website that has a lot of details that we won't go into on this call in terms of um, what the process looks like. There is a session in Mexico that's being held at the end of March, and then there is also a session in, in Paris, France, um, being held just at the end of June and the beginning of July that will be the launch of uh, these blueprints for action. Next slide. So the six action coalition areas are gender-based violence, economic justice and rights, bodily autonomy and sexual and reproductive health and rights, feminist action for climate justice, technology and innovation for gender equality, and feminist movements and leadership. And I will say that there's a lot of work being done to make sure that the nexus of these action areas, understanding, for example, that feminist action for climate justice fundamentally requires us to tackle gender-based violence. It requires bodily autonomy. It requires economic justice and rights. So trying to see the synergies between this, these action areas and also um, recognizing some of the cross-cutting issues to all of these, including a focus on women, peace and security, as well as a focus on youth and adolescent girls. Um, these are all some of the framing pieces for the Generation Equality Forum, uh, as we're trying to identify what key actions under these six areas look like. Uh, and these six areas were really defined with consultations with civil society. Again, going back to where did the Beijing Platform for Action work to advance actions? And what is the, the current status of the world right now where we need to create and enhance and advance actions um, to particularly deal with the crises we're facing now? Next slide. So under the Feminist Action for Climate Justice Blueprint, we are working together to develop a blueprint that will deliver concrete progress towards gender equality and the realization of girls and women's human rights. 
We've been tasked to identify three to four game-changing, transformative, and measurable actions that will inspire, catalyze, um, and catalyze the efforts of multiple stakeholders. And we have been tasked to advance this vision against a five-year implementation timeline. And so I will show you the four broad areas that we are working through as a framing of our blueprint, noting that these areas are still being defined and still being given the real substance in terms of what, what the action commitments under it look like. And what we'll spend the rest of this call on with our speakers is trying to highlight what kinds of solutions, as said before, we think really relate to these key broad action areas and hopefully get you excited to join the Action Coalition. Next slide. So that the broad action areas that we've identified so far through a series of consultations, again, as said, among uh, our action coalition that's made up of government, civil society, UN organizations, uh, as well as philanthropy. So the first is to increase the direct access to financing for gender just climate solutions. And I would say, at least from WeDo's perspective, we see this as a really critical, um, a critical area to re-shift and to shift the flows of financing away from harm to invest in care. And what does that look like beyond just um, perhaps earmarking a certain amount of funds to particular programs, um, to particular solutions? That's, of course, part of this. But a bigger piece is how do we really take a systemic approach to shifting finance as a whole? We want to then enable women and girls to lead a just transition to a green economy. And of course, this is multifaceted in terms of, of enhancing leadership, of breaking down gender norms of understanding what a just transition looks like to a low carbon economy, what jobs will look like, and how do we ensure that the, the transition that we have will not just take the current sexual division of labor uh, and reinforce that in a quote unquote low carbon economy. Um, but it also, of course, means uh, broader systemic approaches as well. We want to build the resilience of women and girls to climate impacts and disaster risks. And finally, we want to increase the collection and use of data on the gender environment nexus. And this came out really strongly from a lot of the co-leads, as well as in consultations we've had of just the real challenge folks have with not having access to data, but also with data collection in general at this intersection. Next slide. So now we're going to jump into conversations with the um, with our wonderful allies and partners uh, who are on the call to think through what does action across these four areas look like. So I want to jump right away to my colleague Ann Barr, who is from uh, Women Engage for a Common Future, and is going to share with us a program that the Women and Gender Constituency, in partnership with WECF, has been working on for the last six years now. Um, around really elevating gender just climate solutions as key solutions to the climate challenge. So Anne, over to you. Thank you very much, Bridget. And uh, good day to everybody. Good morning or evening, depending on where you're joining us from. I'm very pleased to be able to present uh, the, our gender just climate solutions uh, awards and mentoring program to you. Uh, and why it's so important to uh, shift finance and uh, increase direct access to finance for these type of solutions. So if you want to have a look at these uh, solutions on the next slide, you will see uh, the cover of the publication that uh, we just um, came out with in this last December, featuring uh, the award winners of the last uh, six years. Uh, as indeed we started uh, the Gender Just Climate Solutions Program at COP21 in Paris, um, together with the Women and Gender Constituency, as one of, of the major, um, I would say, concrete uh, advocacy illustration of our work. Um, so in the next slide, you see a few pictures of the highlights and the big moments uh, of the award ceremony from COP21 to COP25. Uh, and the next slide shows you where the uh, 15 award winners 
uh, that have won the awards uh, through the years come from. So you see a very broad diversity of uh, countries and people. Um, and uh, these uh, award-winning um, solutions are really there to highlight why it's important to mainstream gender justice into climate action. And they are all really exemplary initiatives. We've conducted in 2020 uh, a survey about the impact of these uh, initiatives. And on the next slide, I can show you uh, how these initiatives have demonstrated um, to really act both on climate mitigation and adaptation. So they can reduce emissions and air pollution, protect uh, biodiversity, including, for example, reforestation. Uh, they work also on water protection or reduce the risk uh, for climate related disasters. Uh, they contribute to uh, resilient organic agriculture or sustainable production and consumption. So it's a very diverse set of uh, exemplary initiatives. On the next slide, you will see that, of course, these solutions also have very strong impact on gender and they actually bring multiple transformative benefits for the entire society. Uh, whether they, they are bringing positive change in gender roles and gender no norms, whether they work on increasing women's rights, uh, empowering uh, women on the social and economic um, uh, side, uh, or whether they bring a positive change also in the community, in gender relations and power relations. Uh, they have a very broad uh, and diverse uh, impact on gender. Uh, on the next slide, um, I can also show you that um, our work has been to contribute to the upscaling and the replication, replication of such uh, of exemplary uh, solutions. And uh, how have these uh, been successful? But as you see, through um, our program, inviting the award winners back into participating into um, climate conferences, uh, into the COPs every year, uh, and um, working with the award winners uh, through workshops, through trainings and exchange of experience, we've seen that most of the award winners have been able to actually reach a new scale uh, or uh, enlarge uh, the dimension of their action. Uh, and uh, many of them have reached in the next slide, sorry. Uh, many of them have been able uh, to uh, reach uh, new recognition and especially uh, new financial support. And that is really what we are leading at. Um, I also wanted to bring on uh, one important element is that uh, all of these initiatives have shown to have a, a positive impact uh, on uh, the resilience to the COVID crisis as well, which you see on the next slide. Uh, so they have demonstrated really a very strong resilience capacity um, in uh, being able to uh, run awareness raising uh, or um, information activities related to hygiene measures bringing uh, vital support to their beneficiaries who have lost income during the crisis, for example, or also distributing uh, protection materials and making advocacy uh, to defend the rights uh, of their beneficiaries. So these are really uh, solutions and initiatives that uh, bring a transformational change. Now, let me give you just a few uh, examples, if I still have time, of the type of, uh, of initiatives that we have uh, celebrated the impacts of in the recent uh, years. So uh, one example in the next slide. Yes, this is um, from Dorothée. So Dorothée Lisenga uh, is in the Democratic Republic of Congo, and she works on ensuring land tenure rights for women uh, and their ability to participate in forest governance. And in the next slide, you will see that um, the impact has been uh, very strong with almost 500 uh, women advocates being trained uh, 
mapping exercising being done to recognize where women works in community on which land and have their land tenure rights being recognized. Uh, also certified uh, ownership titles for women and an integration of all this work into the new climate policy of the Republic uh, of Congo, the Democratic Republic of Congo. Another example is from India, Trupti Jain. Um, she leads a social enterprise called Narita Services. And this social enterprise has uh, invented a, a water storage solution for very poor women farmers in different uh, drought prone areas of India. Uh, and she has brought in the next slide, you will see um, uh, a, a transformation of living conditions for thousands of women farmers, involving them really in the maintenance and, and the technology, um, which is something very, um, let's say, uh, transformational for, for women in this society. Uh, and it has really improved uh, their ability to survive and uh, be resilient in times of crisis. I think I won't have time to run over more examples, but I invite you to uh, take a look uh, at the publication that you can find on the website of the Women and Gender Constituency and also of WECF, uh, where you will find all, all of these examples and many more uh, of um, exemplary solutions that have been nominated uh, for these awards. And they all demonstrate why it is so important to really shift finance and bring much more means uh, for these type uh, of solutions that bring multiple co-benefits uh, to the society. Uh, and I'm very glad to be able to uh, coordinate this program for the women and gender constituency. So thank you very much for your attention and back to you, Bridget. Thank you so much, Anne. Uh, and thank you for sharing all of those with us. I think, you know, when you look at the blueprint and, and the work that's being done, it's exactly these types of solutions that we know we need to center in our dialogue on climate action. Um, but so often they are not the, the types of solutions that we see in spaces such as the UN um, or in larger spaces and conversations at national level that are thinking about what climate action looks like. Uh, and, and just to give you a little backstory, um, the Women and Gender Constituency was inspired to do this work um, you know, over six years ago around one of the large climate summits when as, an, as a constituency, we had put forward some of these solutions to be highlighted as effective climate action. And we're told that these were too small um, and that they didn't you know, fit the profile of climate action. And so we, we really understood then that there was a lot of work that needed to be done to show why these replicated and invested in at scale were sustainable models that could be um, that could be used in communities around the world and that we're having transformative impacts on creating resilience in communities. And so hopefully as part of this, uh, as part of the blueprint over the next five years, we'll be creating a greater channel, a greater, a greater amplifier of these already existing women-led, often women-led gender just solutions that are working at community level. And with that, I wanna pass directly to um, Rinali Rai, who is, someone who works particularly around biodiversity uh, for many years now, uh, who coordinates the Women's Caucus at the, at the Convention on Biological Diversity um, to share again, these intersecting, um, these intersecting crises. So um, over to you. Thanks, Bridget. Uh, just give me a moment. I'm trying to share my screen. Um... Uh, just to make sure that everybody can see my screen. Yes, we can. Great. I'm going to keep my, uh, um, let me just do this. <laughs> if everybody can't see me. Um, okay, so that's clear. Um, hi, everybody. This is Rinalini. And I will be, um, I will be talking about the um, action tour enabling women and girls to lead a just transitions to a green economy. So around the world, women and women are leaders, stewards, educators, engineers, farmers, and scientists 
who contribute invaluable experience and knowledge to effectively safeguard our environment and realize sustainable development goals. So having that basis of the, the important roles that women play in different spheres. So we just want, I just want to do a quick um, analysis of where women are. So where are they in top decision-making positions? So uh, this month during the, this International Women's Day, IUCN revealed a new data on women's leadership in environmental ministries. So uh, similar, so in 2015, the IUCN's gender and uh, environment and gender information data uh, showed that there were 12% um, of 881 national environmental ministries across 193 countries were led by women. The same study that they did in 2020, five years later, IUCN's new data reveals incremental change. So there has been in 2020, women um, held 15% of job jobs at ministries of environmental sectors. So there has been a roughly 3% change. While many countries have developed or consolidated ministries focused on climate change in the last five years, according to the IUCN, uh, 26 total ministries, 15% are headed by women. In 46 countries with forest-related ministries, 80%, 18% are headed by women, while 11% of water irrigation minister, ministries are headed by women. Now, looking at this change, it's not really much, but like I think Bridget also talked about, that it hasn't been as expected as we would have, looking at that it's been 25 years, the beating platform of action, and uh, looking at this data. So this is what we are looking at with the, with the uh, decision makers. So I just wanted to give you a, a quick glance of, of what are some of the realities facing at the national level. So I just took a quick example of women in agriculture in India. And this is again, just recently, a few days ago, this organization, a local organization, it's a forum for women's farmers rights called Makam, took out this infographic. And the data they have used is from the census of 2011, where um, it shows that 65.1% of the total female workers in the country are involved in agriculture. So that's a huge, really, huge, a big percentage of the population. Now the operational land holding of women farmer, farmers, they found that there was no data on land owned by women, but they used the data from 2015 and 2016 um, and which showed that there is 13.8% that they own. However, a footnote here is saying that, that the operational land holding is not the same as ownership of land. So this is where I think we're also talking about where do we really need to strengthen these participation, these governance models for a green economy. And these are the, are the statistics that um, are, are existing even in the current day. Um, but however, having said that, um, I just in the last minute, I thought I, thought I would share this, is that, that though there is hope, I'm, I'm being very positive here, this is a, a cover of a Time magazine of this month. And if you have been following the, uh, the movement, the farmers movement taking place in India uh, since a couple of months, actually, uh, this photo of women uh, made it to the, to the front cover and showing uh, uh, the way that women are now getting out and, and, and women who have never even left the villages are out in, in the capital city of Delhi and demanding for their rights and also demanding for their rights to be recognized as farmers. So there are, again, on the side, there are these movements that are growing on and there are women movement at the local level, at the ground level who are working towards getting their voices heard. However, as we are already over a year uh, dealing with COVID, this is a, a data report from the UN DESA on the policy brief on the impact of COVID-19 on indigenous peoples and their data on the women was that, that this year 2020 will push 96 million people into extreme poverty and 47 million of, of whom are women and girls. So this is also really showing us that I think I won't repeat a lot that what the panelists have also talked before of this extra burden of um, on the roles and responsibilities of women with the, uh, since a year since the pandemic started. 
this is again another issue i would say for a greener economy for us to, and uh, this issue that has been coming up it's not something new is on looking at the biodiversity human rights defenders and this again is a very popular report that we all are um, are, are familiar with and to so to mitigate climate change we have to tackle the drivers of biodiversity loss and many of these communities of whom are indigenous peoples and many of whom are women. So they, they, there are, again, these are the, the, the women um, who, are, who are defending their, their lands and territories and resources on the ground. So what do we really need? So understanding the gender environment nexus is not only key to understanding social and environmental equalities and barriers to sustainable development, but to unlocking options for transformation actions as well. According to a UN Environment Report 2016, data gaps at this nexus, however, are persistent. Limited collection, dissemination, and application of gender environment statistics, including at national level, affects decision makers and practitioners knowledge and capacity to develop and adopt well-informed and effective policies and programming at all levels. So what we're really looking at is, is that, that uh, women's rights, women's secure land rights are fundamental human rights. Giving them that right gives them a right to their culture, right to health, right to their self-determination, including FPA, free prior informed consent, and right to life. Prioritizing women's political and social empowerment and leadership, particularly for those who experience intersecting forms of discrimination of race, class, sexuality, gender, ethnicity, location, et cetera, that prevent the participation on equal terms. We need to ensure that women's consistently suppressed histories, voices and perspectives can come forward and they can lead. From the perspective of women and those facing multiple oppressions, having safe space, equitable treatment and recognition of fundamental rights and freedom, rights to access and ownership of land and resources and benefit sharing is essential to a just transition to a greener economy. So having said that, I'm just gonna see what we are doing as women for biodiversity is that as uh, we just said that we are uh, following up on the CBD, the Convention on Biological Diversity, one of the Rio uh, conventions together with UNSCCC and UNCCD. And in that, I think this is what we are looking at synergies, looking at where this generation um, equality forum and the discussions on gender would, I'm really hoping would again strengthen this biodiversity framework, which is called the post 2020 global biodiversity framework in helping us to strengthen these elements of that draft. So I'm just going to kind of end in that. Um, sorry for rushing in and I'll be here for any questions that you may have. Uh, Bridget, back to you. Thank you. Thank you, Marinalini. It was a really helpful overview. And there are some follow up questions that folks had in the chat. Uh, if you want to take a look at that, um, we'll also note all of these questions and make sure to get back, um, as well as share the link to the website, um, Women for Biodiversity, that was just shared. Thank you for that. I'm going to pass over to Laura from IUCN, Laura Cooper Hall. And IUCN, I will say, is also one of the co-leads of this action coalition. So over to you, Laura. Thank you, Bridget. And thanks everyone. It's a pleasure to be with all of you today. On behalf of the gender team at IUCN, we're grateful to have this opportunity to unite with allies and especially to hear from you, the CSW audience, to ensure that the global community forges urgent action to meet climate resilience and women's rights goals, because of course these go hand in hand. IUCN, the International Union for the Conservation of Nature is a member union, and we are a convener for science-based knowledge and action. This is the frame we use when we're working and in these collaborative spaces. We joined as a consortium partner because we know that we can never meet our sustainable development and conservation goals for a healthy and peaceful planet without working with partners and across sectors to further gender equality. For us, the value of, or for engaging with generation equality is twofold. One, it is a chance to renew attention and momentum to the important work that has been and continues to take place and must continue to grow and scale. 
we must recognize and pay tribute to work that has already been happening and that we still, we also must recognize that we still have work to do. And it is also to use our networks and the spaces we are in to bring feedback from non-members in the Action Coalition into the commitment and action design process. The action statements under the Feminist Action for Climate Justice blueprint echo the range of work IUCN is implementing, growing, and contributing to, and speak to the priorities IUCN believes are fundamental to a just future. Resilience is a key component. What does resilience mean? To IUCN, it means a healthy planet, rich with diverse and flourishing ecosystems, and a stable climate, which people are responsible for and in turn allows for all people to thrive for life and sustained livelihoods. And a lot of this can link to what Murnalini has pointed out on biodiversity. At the end of the day, resilience is about our ability to live and thrive and to create an e ecosystem for that. Resilience also means equal access to resources and to support systems. This is fundamental. We know this and we see it every day in our programming. The concept of resilience touches on all of the action coalitions. It's likely that many of you listening now are working on issues which strengthen the resilience of women, that many of you are working on issues that will support women as climate threats worsen across the globe. IUCN, at IUCN, we're looking for ways to leverage this blueprint in the action coalition and the value of working in a more integrated way. That includes working across hubs and in particular tackle, tackling gender-based violence as one of the most pervasive and perverse forms of keeping inequity intact, not least when it comes to natural resources and to climate action. At IUCN, we believe the blueprint actions of the Generation Equality Hub focused on gender-based violence or GBV are also ours. They include creating and enabling a policy and programming environment for the elimination of GBV, adapting and scaling evidence-based strategies to mitigate and respond to GBV, supporting survivors, and ensuring women's organizations are resourced and positioned with power to exercise their rights. Why? Because we know that GBV and climate change are linked that GBV is both an expression of gender inequality and a tool to keep it intact, including to sustain the status quo when it comes to the power dynamics surrounding the drivers of climate change and climate change response. Last year, with grateful support from USAID, we were able to publish a major study examining GBV and climate change links. We found that GBV is regularly used across sectors as a form of socioeconomic control to maintain or promote unequal and gendered power dynamics related to accessing, using, controlling, and benefiting from natural resources. We also found clear evidence that the potential for violence increases in the face of environmental stressors where scarcity increases tension and power imbalance and reduces resilience. This is a serious concern when we think about the impacts of a changing climate on countries, communities, and families. Climate change decision makers, donors, programmers, and projects can be positions, positioned as agents of change to tackle these dynamics, critical to resilience of women and girls in all their diversity. Turning the recommendations of our research into action we created a space for curated knowledge, tools, and technical support for actors working across environment and climate related spheres. The GBV and Environment Linkages Center now houses a library, technical tools, and project support aimed to close the knowledge gap on GBV environment issues, mobilize learning, and forge collaborative action toward ending GBV and securing environmental sustainability. Including GBV and environment and climate change work is vital for gender responsive environment policy making, programming, and practice. Generation Equality understands the importance of partnership and working across sectors, including always with women and girls and women's organizations at the heart of driving solutions. As a member union, IUCN echoes this priority and believes in the importance of tackling tough issues together. We have a decades long collaboration with UNDP and we do on gender and climate change, not least in our joint founding of the Global Gender and Climate Alliance, 
more than 10 years ago, an alliance that grew to over 100 diverse members from around the world. We look forward to picking up where we left off and using the blueprint established through the Feminist Action for Climate Justice to guide our action and the priorities and goals of our partners and potential partners. At the moment, we are transitioning into finalizing the actions and likely will need to develop indicators for measurement, which will, which will contribute to a roadmap to define what we are trying to measure and trying to achieve in this coalition. What are the measures of change and the indicators that you all see linked to these actions? We would really love to hear your thoughts. How do we better measure what resilience is and what it means to communities? I'd love to hear from you all as listeners and potential contributors to the goals and, and indicators about what you think is most important to appreciate, appreciate and include in our Feminist Action for Climate Justice Action Coalition. Thanks everyone. Over to you, Bridget. Thank you so much, Laura, for that. And I'm, I'm noting as well the different um, questions in the chat. There was a really great question on, um, you know, what is the, the push for women's land ownership? How it in relation to climate change? Is there, is there an impact that women's land ownership has on, um, on climate and on protecting ecosystems as well? So that's a, a useful question for folks to think about. Um, there was also a request for reports and links for some of the, the stats being shared here. Um, I'm sure we will, um, I'm not, I don't know the exact process right now, but I'm sure these slides will be made available to you on the, the Pathable site if that's possible. And if, if folks want to continue to share links in the chat, we will do so. Um, but with that, I'm going to move to Lalu Maya Kadel from ECMOD. Um, uh, Lalu, over to you. Lalu, if you are speaking, you might be muted. Hello. Yeah, there you hello. Uh, yeah. Uh, thank you, uh, Bridget. Uh, I'm Lalu uh, Maya Kadel from uh, ECMOT, uh, International Center for Integrated Mountain Development. Um, first of all, I'd like to thank Laura and Tim uh, for giving us uh, this opportunity to share our experience uh, in this important forum and also learn from others. Uh, I'm going to talk about uh, collection and use of data uh, on gender and environmental nexus and our experience in this area. Uh, we, uh, I think I, I no need to remind the importance of the data here, but still I'd like to take an uh, example from the COVID-19 uh, uh, situation, which is very recent and everyone have experience of this one, uh, to understand the importance of data. Uh, in everyday life. Um, I'm not from the health background. Uh, even for me, uh, I, um, I, I would go for, to visit the WHO site uh, every day, uh, especially at the beginning of COVID-19, uh, to understand the situation, how fast it was spreading, and the scale and the intensity. So, and the data was very helpful, uh, actually, uh, especially for me to take a precautionary uh, measures um, in, in daily life. So hence, uh, this shows the importance of data in everyday uh, life. Uh, over time, we can also see that uh, the differential impact of different countries and communities uh, of this pandemic. So for example, Nepal reports higher suicide cases during this uh, crisis. This shows any changes are not neutral and people react to these changes differently based on their roles, responsibilities, and other situation. Uh, this shows uh, the importance of disaggregated data again. Uh, the international uh, decisions made on gender disaggregated data at different times, including Beijing Conference on Women in 1995, also proves uh, the importance of the disaggregated data. Uh, importance of disaggregated data in Hindu Kush Himali region where we work is still higher uh, because of higher diversity, higher impact of climate change and, uh, and lower coping capacity of the people living here. However, data gap uh, widely, is widely accepted a uh, fact at least in our region. Uh, it is worse uh, for disaggregated and nexus data if available, uh, they are very much scattered in different reports. 
Uh, this has been a challenge for effective implementation of policy and plans and reaching to the needy people on time. Uh, other important issue is uh, data consistency across countries. Uh, ECMOT uh, works uh, in eight uh, member countries and our focus is more on the transboundary issues. So we work uh, for river basins, a transboundary landscape, air pollution, et cetera. Uh, in this case, of, uh, we, we, the data consistency is a major challenge for us to understand the context better across uh, the countries. Uh, further data collection in Hindu Kush Himali region is difficult uh, and also very costly because of its uh, 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 difficult uh, mountain terrain. Uh, Isimut being a knowledge organization, part of our work is uh, to fill these data gaps for which uh, we have uh, different initiatives. Uh, we conduct uh, research and assessments uh, and gender and social inclusion is one of the uh, priority area. Uh, for example, uh, poverty and vulnerability assessment, um, we have already uh, completed. Uh, Hindu Kusimale reason uh, assessment report is available, day, uh, available there. And based on which uh, we uh, conducted the ministerial um, uh, level summit and which also uh, signed the HKS call to action, which includes uh, six urgent actions uh, for the SKH. And one of them is uh, related to data and uh, knowledge. And all of these uh, data like uh, other more things, uh, the SKS status on sustainable development goal is under progress. And uh, we are also uh, working on the Hindu Kush Himalaya region poverty analysis. This is also under progress. And uh, those already completed uh, the data uh, are available um, uh, in terms of the report also in our repository, Himal Talk. Everyone can visit that one and get that one. And the, the 800, uh, this source shows the 868,369 downloads in 2020 itself. So this is uh, very important. Uh, all data contents there and in terms of report and then um, in other forms also. And based on the SK's assessment, um, uh, all data, what comes from there, they are also uh, put on regional database system. So this includes, uh, also includes the MODIS data. In 2020, 751 unique users uh, downloaded a total of 4,266 data sets. So this is functional. Uh, other important thing, very much focused on the gender, uh, sex and age disaggregated data uh, um, from all national uh, statistics uh, are pulled together in the form of gender atlas. And then uh, this is uh, this aims to address the access issue in the Hindu Kush Himalaya region. So though they are available, we can't find them in one place, and this will be helpful for that one. Isimut also conducts a pilot and access research on resilient uh, mountain solutions uh, to demonstrate uh, evidence and to influence the policy. And there are many examples that they are adopted and obfuscated by the government and others. Uh, and we, we believe in partnership and engage with many global, regional and national institutions like IPCC, IPPES, UNFCCC, CBD, Himalayan, UASS, uh, uh, many uh, more. So we have uh, Sandy, uh, which focus on more economic um, aspect, uh, economic resource, and then Himalayan University Consortium, which collaborates many academic and research institutions. Uh, across the region. Uh, capacity building uh, is other important component for us. Um, we, we focus the capacity of the country partners um, from uh, all eight member countries for adopting gender responsive and uh, evidence-based decision-making practices. Um, Co-development of climate and information service uh, is one of uh, one way of promoting use and integration of biophysical and socioeconomic data in evidence-based uh, decision-making. Uh, in this whole process in ECMOT, uh, gender responsive monitoring and evaluation system is, is very important and 
and uh, playing a great role for a mainstreaming gender in all ECMOD supported program. So which is also highlighted in one of our publication, um, making gender count, leveraging monitoring and evaluation to mainstreaming gender. Uh, gender is complex issue. Thus, both the quantitative and qualitative data are important for understanding and promoting their use uh, has uh, different phases uh, to consider. So with this, I'd like to uh, conclude uh, here. Thank you very much uh, for listening. If there are any questions and more uh, uh, elaboration is required, so I'm happy to respond that one. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Lalu, and I hope that from this, and I know that, that colleagues have been putting um, links in the chat to some of the reports that you shared. Sorry, Bridget, you muted yourself. You're muted. Can you hear me now? Oh, uh, yeah. Was I, can I muted hear. the whole time? Sorry about that. Um, so hopefully you're starting to see um, what the possibility of this blueprint could really be. Uh, in terms of, of the understanding that this is a very layered issue of what does real feminist action for climate justice look like? Um, how does that action tackle both the solutions that we have, the finance that is needed for those solutions, the data collection that we have to do to be able to advocate for effective policy change, um, the work that needs to be due to change laws and norms in terms of building resilience and capacity, as well as the fundamentals of shifting whose voice is being centered in these conversations through really advancing the leadership of women and girls and all their diversity at all levels of climate action. And part of that is the power in the diverse partnership um, behind the Action Coalition, CSOs, UN agencies, institutions, governments, and philanthropy as well. Um, and I want to pass now to Maria Inez Rivendiniera, who's a gender and climate change specialist with the UNDP uh, NDC support program in Ecuador. Over to you. Thank you, Bridget. Good morning and good afternoon for everyone. Thank you for having me. I am pleased to present the Ecuadorian experience about the collection and use of data uh, on the gender environment nexus, specifically in climate change policy. Um, in Ecuador, a gender mainstreaming approach has been held at the first national determinant contribution to the Paris Agreement during the, per the period 2018 and 2020. The Ministry of Environment and the National Council for Gender Equality with the NDC Super Program in the UNDP have led the process for developing a specific gender methodology, both for quantitative analysis and for qualitative data collection through the participatory process. As a result, the NDC and its implementation plan has a gender baseline and the identification of gender gaps and their responses by sector and prioritize initiatives. The main gender gaps identified for all sectors in mitigation and adaptation are first, quality and valid gender disaggregated data linked with the efforts for reduced emissions and with the need for increasing resilient capacities and reducing vulnerabilities. The second barrier found is the institutional and organizational gender capacities. There is a cultural behavior which reproduces gender roles and stereotypes limiting the well-being for women and children. The third gap for all sectors is participation and representation at technical, scientific, and decision-making spaces for women. A rigorous gender analysis allowed to have a data collection and strategic interpretation of differentiated benefits for women and men into the climate action. Nevertheless, there are a lack of specific statistics for a better comprehension of women and men conditions practical and strategic needs in adaptation and mitigation scenarios. Some examples are violence based on gender, criminalization of defenders of nature, food insecurity, climate migration, housing unrest, decision-making and women real participation related with the access and use and control of natural resources, biodiversity loss, 
land degradation, among others. With this background, there is an ongoing process for building a gender and climate change information system in Ecuador with georeference that data. With the support of the NDC Support Program, Let's Lack and the Mexican Institute for Statistics, this geoportal will be in an open source tool and will allow an interface with different baselines and data systems. At the moment, there is under developing the design of this platform and the government is expecting to have all the system working for 2022. However, at 2018, with the available data, a pilot for integrating gender perspective into the monitoring, report, and verification system at the Electricity Initiative was complete successfully. At the second phase, since 2020, the NDC Super Program is supporting the integration of gender perspective into the finance tracking methodologies, business rounds, and economic analysis. The data collection and the management of strategic information are critical for a better comprehension of women and men realities, their needs and opportunities. Without information, their real realities are invisible for public policy design. In environment and climate change action, social and gender data is, all, is not always available. That is the case in Ecuador. The efforts for conservation to diversity, adaptation to the negative impacts of climate change or reduced emissions could fail if they do not take in account of the social and gender data about the local communities. Information about the population conditions must be essential at the moment of design, implement and monitoring environment and climate change actions. The better, the better way to interlink the sustainable development goals is making decision based on evidence. For making that happen, it's mandatory to have better quality of data. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Maria Inez. And we had some um, good questions in the chat um, around the use of acronyms that we have in, uh, in these slides and, and the presentations, and that is a very valid um, uh, concern as well. I think part of part of the action coalition. I think part of the work that we can do in this blueprint through these partnerships is demystifying um, the broader kind of uh, international level process space where some of these issues get discussed. This intersection of gender, climate, and biodiversity to make sure, of course, that is both um, reflective of what is happening at grassroots level. Um, but that it is also uh, interpretable, if that's the, the right word, that, that we're creating systems where information is flowing really from the grassroots to these processes uh, and making sure that these processes are, are both being responsive to and led by the work that's happening at grassroots level. Um, so our last intervention is going to come from Molly Gilligan, also speaking to, um, who's a gender environment policy specialist, also speaking to this need for enhancing our um, collection of data at this environment and gender nexus. So over to you, Molly. Thanks, Bridget. Hi, everyone. Um, I am Molly Gilligan. I use she, her pronouns, um, and I'm on Piscataway land in the Washington DC area. I'm thrilled to be with you all today to join this conversation and to discuss the importance of data on the gender and environment nexus. I wanted to thank all the previous speakers. I've really enjoyed learning about your initiatives um, around the various action areas. To further highlight the fourth action area on increasing the collection and use of data on the gender and environment nexus, I wanted to first spotlight efforts that IUCN and UNEP, the UN Environment Program, took together to learn more about national level statistics and enabling environment. And I know there have been some questions requesting uh, links to publications. So uh, later on, I'll put links for every publication that I mentioned. Um, so in our report, we explore the idea that collection and dissemination of national level gender and environment statistics offers an opportunity to shine a light on a set of interconnected issues that can either undermine or accelerate progress towards sustainable development. These statistics advance global understanding of gender gaps and help to tell a story of transformation connecting the dots on how realizing women's rights and gender equality 
um, can support outcomes across the environmental and sustainable development sphere and vice versa. Through action research in Laos, Kenya, Mexico, and Jordan, we noted a few key aspects for creating an enabling environment for national level gender and environment statistics. This includes national gender equality laws, mandates and policies to provide a supportive framework, coordination among ministries to ensure the interconnected nature of these topics is embraced, and capacity for gender environment statistics to support cross-sectoral and cross-institutional capacity for both understanding and applying statistics for climate justice action. Data on the gender and environment nexus can offer a space to bring people together toward advancing gender equality and sustainable development. Data at every level is important, which means that everyone can play a role. While the enabling environments that I mentioned were identified to support national level efforts, these concepts can carry into other types of organizations and work as well at all levels, um, ranging from international development to grassroots community-led efforts to advance gender equality and climate change adaptation. So for example, a strong supportive policy framework can provide a mandate for prioritizing gender equality within climate change adaptation efforts, um, coordination either internally with a different department or perhaps seeking out complementary partner organizations can help to strengthen the cross-sectoral approach to these interlinked concepts. And promoting advanced statistical capacity uh, can help all of us to better collect and or use data within our work whether at project level, for policy advocacy, or wherever your focus lies. In addition to enabling environments, we also identified indicators that can be used to gather information and strategies for national action um, as stakeholders work together toward meeting the sustainable development goals. This poses both challenges and opportunities moving forward. Uh, we have identified entry points within the SDGs, uh, the sustainable development goals, where sex disaggregation can contribute to a better understanding of gender considerations within environmental sectors. Um, however, there are really only two uh, relevant environmental indicators currently within the framework um, that do include sex disaggregation in their methodologies. So these are um, SDGs 1.4.2 on secure rights to land and 5.8.1 on agricultural um, population with secure rights to land to agricultural land. So um, many countries, regions, agencies, and organizations have embraced the opportunities advancing gender and environment statistics within their own work. Um, in addition to the amazing examples we've heard from the other speakers, um, <laughs> my, my cat is saying hi as well. <laughs> um, I also wanted to mention that uh, Mexico is a trailblazer on this issue. Um, and also to highlight an effort that UN Women and SCAP um, are doing together to support, sorry, to support data collection efforts in the Asia and Pacific region. Um, this opportunity also extends beyond the sustainable development goals as well, uh, which is why I'm so excited to see gender and environment data as a priority action. Fred, <laughs> she loves Zoom calls. <laughs> Um, anyway, I'm excited to see uh, data be one of the priority areas for the feminist action um, on climate justice coalition. It's also why I hope that groups interested in participating in this coalition uh, will consider the ways in which data, uh, with the ways in which you can advance data collection within your own work. Um, I also wanted to mention that I was thrilled to see one of the previous speakers uh, highlight new data from um, IUCN about uh, women environmental ministers. So I was going to use that as an example of what action um, on this area can look like. So I won't I won't be too repetitive, um, but just to say that it's it was an interesting um, way, it, an interesting time to update the statistics. So we saw a three percent increase um, from 2015 to 2020, which also corresponds to a 3% increase um, seen by the IPU when looking at women parliamentarians over the same time period. Um, another really fun example uh, to get to what Bridget mentioned in the beginning about connecting the different action areas um, for these coalitions. 
is that IUCN and USAID um, recently published a report on the triple nexus on gender equality, climate change vulnerability, and state fragility. So that's another just cool way that data can be used to connect these topics, to highlight where they intersect, um, and to advance our understanding of the roles that, that women can play. Um, so with that, I would encourage each of you to consider ways in which you can promote an enabling environment for advancing data on the gender environment nexus within your own work. Thank you. Back to you, Bridget. Thanks, Molly. We love cat coworkers and, and data at this intersection. So thank you for bringing us both of that. Um, all right, so we are gonna move now into uh, really a, a, an opportunity to hear from all of you um, and to think through what does engagement with this action coalition potentially look like? We wanted to really give uh, a flavor of the different initiatives that we are trying to bring together in the, in the action coalition. Again, folks working at many different levels. And I did want to say, as we think about this, you know, feminist action for climate justice. What do we mean by feminist? And what do we mean by climate justice? And I'm not going to say that I speak for all of the action coalition co-leads in this space, but one of the things from the perspective of what does feminist action look like, I'm often reminded of a quote by WeDo's co-founder, Bella Abzug, who said, women do not want to simply be mainstreamed into a polluted stream. We want to change the stream, make it clean and green and safe for all, every gender, race, creed, sexual orientation, age, and ability. And Bella said that over 25 years ago. Uh, and I think from the perspective of what we are trying to do, it is really beyond just mainstreaming gender into environmental policy or action. It's really thinking about what is a systemic approach? What is feminist action that is about changing the polluted stream? How do we do this? How do we take these action areas, the action area and the blueprint and make sure we're moving beyond um, what I think the last 10 years of work, particularly for those who work at this intersection, have been really doing a lot of the heavy lifting and work to try to make sure that we have uh, international policies um, on environment and climate and biodiversity that understand the intersection to gender equality. But we're now at a really critical point of making sure that the change that we're pushing for is systemic in nature. And why climate justice is really grounding ourselves in the understanding that although climate change affects all of us, it fundamentally does not affect us equally in terms of who has access to resources, who has access to rights, but also in terms of, you know, and that cuts across countries as well as in communities themselves. Uh, and so I think that when we're thinking about what does action look like under these areas, it's really important that we take we take from the starting point of where we're all coming into this space. There are so many incredible grassroots activists, environmental defenders who are putting their bodies on the line to protect their communities from, from projects that they don't, um, that, that they're not permitted on their lands, for example, that are putting their bodies on the lines to protect water, to protect the forests. And then we have, you know, UN organizations and institutions that are fighting within structures to reset the ways in which we collect data, to reset the ways in which we structure our leadership, structure our decision making, to be more feminist, to be more equitable, and to really reflect the true diversity and representation of our communities and populations. Uh, and I think all of that work is critical, and it needs to be working in synergy together, and needs to be uplifting, and really needs to be driven by um, the action that's being demanded, particularly at grassroots level. So we're hoping, I think, again, speaking as myself, but on behalf of the other co-leads, we're hoping that this inspires you to, to think about joining this action coalition. Uh, and just to say a word on that, there is a process on the Generation Equality website right now to become a commitment maker. And you'll see in the lead up to the Paris session in June, I'm sure we'll have a lot more information to share with you on how you can get more involved. But right now, and we can share the link as well, if you think that this is an area that, hey, I'm doing work already in this, or my community is already working in this area, and I would like to you know, share that or make a commitment to be part of this action coalition, uh, whether it is because you have an action that relates to 
to finance and scaling finance, or you have a solution that you're implementing on the ground, you're working to build education, uh, advocacy, capacity and resilience at a grassroots level, um, or you're working on data collection, information sharing, beyond just data collection, education, transformative gendered uh, and green education. What does that look like? We have a lot of partners doing work at that intersection as well. Um, but here I'd like to open up to, uh, to all of you to share again, you know, your the ways in which you are working that potentially relate to or contribute to this action area. Any thoughts that you have on things that you feel are missing from what we've shared here that's a critical component of what would be feminist action for climate justice that you haven't heard or you would like to um, hear more about. Um, and I also will pose to my, to my colleagues that we had some really, I think, useful questions around, you know, why are we pushing for women's land rights, for example? What, what is the relationship to that in climate action? Um, and, and perhaps those who want to extrapolate a bit more on why, why do we as a collective believe that enhancing gender equality will both is critical to climate action and vice versa? So I would welcome my colleagues to also, if anything inspires them to speak to that, to do so as well. Um, Mara, just to check in with you, I'm not sure, can folks, if they raise their hand, can we invite them to unmute themselves? Yes, we can. Okay. So I'm gonna just check, or maybe you could help me with this, Mara, in terms of checking the chat to see if anyone has um, added something in or if anyone has their hand raised. Definitely. So one person, Mimi, has their hand raised. I'm also wondering if um, Laura has managed to collect a few questions from the chat throughout the event. So maybe we could take Mimi's question and Laura, if you'd be willing to share a few that have come up in the chat, um, and then we can open it up for all panelists. Would that make sense? Okay. I think the hand has been um, lowered. I see. Apologies, accidental. No worries. Well, if folks would like to ask a question to any or all of the panelists, please just go to the bottom bar on Zoom where you see a hand uh, and you can press raise hand there. So I do see one raised right now from um, Shaida. Hi, uh, can you hear me? <laughs> yes, yes, we can. Okay, perfect. Um, I just had a question because I know that Molly, it says for her title um, that she's an environmental policy specialist. And I was kind of curious about like how this form of new inclusive data, not new, but more inclusive data collection, like focusing more on like equity um, aligns with new governmental policy as well. Thanks, that's a great question. Um, do you guys want me to address it now or do we want to throw a couple of questions out? Um, okay. Uh, yeah, thanks for the question. Um, so I think we've all seen that um, data can help push policies forward. Um, and also in terms of gender equality, we've also seen vice versa, where we've actually had really strong policies um, being adopted early on. And those policies include a mandate for collecting more information, collecting more data. Um, so it's kind of interesting that in this sphere, I think a little bit different from in other spheres where the data is really required for the policy advocacy. We also see the policies coming first and then um, giving others the space and the, the support to spend time and resources on data collection as well. Um, and so with respect to your question about sort of new, more, more inclusive data, um, I will say that, that um, well, we are thrilled that there is more and more new progress on this. It's not a brand new topic um, and, and data collection efforts have been taking place at various levels for, for a, a while. Um, but I think it's really key to see new data coming out and then finding the most strategic ways to use it. Um, so that's kind of why I was excited to see the other um, presenter share the, the data on um, gender and environment women, sorry, women ministers, because she, you shared it in the context of, you know, highlighting women's leadership. And I was going to share it in the context of like, here, here's fun new data. So um, even more exciting to see it being used in, in context like that. Um, and I hope that gets to your question a little bit. 
I wondered if I could pass over to Renalini maybe to speak to the question on and, and and then invite anyone else who wants to come in as well on sort of the the women women's land ownership piece of this um, and you know why why we why this is critical to climate action and, and preservation of biodiversity. Yeah, Bridget, thanks a lot. Um, I think it's really key. You know, when you're talking about green a green um, economy, you're talking about participation, you're talking about rights, human rights defenders. Women, I mean, it's, it's they don't have any rights. In a lot of communities of, of where I come from, most of South Asia or Southeast Asia, where women's rights are completely still not progressed from where they were before. So I think Land, I mean, it's it's something that is, it gives you the right to choose how you want to develop. You know, you're talking about economic empowerment. You cannot have economic empowerment if you don't have um, a right to resources. So when I'm talking about land rights, it's linked up with a lot of different things. You're talking about, like I said, if you have, it's, it's, it's tied to your culture. You know, it's usually the women who are, you know, we always talk about how women are the seat keepers and women are the backbones of intergenerational transfer of knowledge. But when it really comes for them to decide on what they really want to do with the resources they harvest from the forest, how they want to manage the agricultural land, they don't have that right. They are still seen as, you know, caregivers, that's their role. Um, so I think it's really fundamental to really recognize that you really can't ask for women's empowerment if their basic freedom to own something or be recognized because a lot of the other, in all, you'll also see in a lot of the different cultures too, women are still struggling for their citizenship rights. Yeah, so they all are really interlinked of saying that for all, I mean, for me, that's the basis of saying that unless and until you, re you recognize a woman's right to her dignity, that's like, all is a whole compilation of rights, rights to land, rights to a healthy environment, the human rights defenders, her rights of freedom, rights to choose what she wants, rights to her health. And they all are really tied down. And with land, especially in this part of the world, South Asia, Southeast Asia, uh, where majority of the decision makers on land are men. Now, uh, somebody also talked about looking at, when I'm talking about land, I showed the case of India where 65% of the workforce of a workforce of a, of, of a sector are women. But they don't, there is not even data on how many women actually own land. And that's where we are at this stage. So I think it's it's really key, fundamental key in those sectors too to address it, to ensure that they get the benefits from it, there it could have the economic empower which also will help them strengthen their resilience to mitigate climate change, to have their own projects. Uh, if they still have men handing that, it will be again, them in the, in the front, but not necessarily being able to make decisions. So mm -hmm. I hope that helps a little bit, but it's a very complex situation. No, I think it. I think it's really helpful, and I think it's also, it cuts across a lot of the different pieces of this action area, right? Of the fact that, um, part of this is a challenge of not having the data to be able to make this case and the need for understanding what land rights and land ownership looks like and what the impact is of them when you have more equitable access to rights and resources. So we have, of course, the, the fundamental um, human rights-based analysis and demand that, that for really to be able to have full dignity to ensure women's human rights, we need um, access and control over um, and access to rights and resources. Um, and then, you know, we do have some small evidence and, and case studies and work that's been done. So there is data and analysis that shows that, you know, land is used differently, particularly in relation to agriculture in terms of, of subsistence farming versus cash, you know, cash crops and cash farming. And, and what what is the intention and what is the sustainability behind those approaches to the use of land, for example, the protection of land, there's evidence um, around the, the work being done to protect lands. We also, there's a, a small study that came out um, uh, just, I think, two years ago now in, in 2019, which looked in three countries on non uh, projects related to non-timber forest production that showed when 
you had gender equitable um, representation in the community groups that were working to, on this preservation, you had a higher uh, level of efficacy in the way in which the forests were preserved based on having more gender diverse um, and gender rep equal representation in those community groups. So we're starting to see, this is, this is somewhat related to how we see what's happening at community level. We have evidence from what we're hearing from grassroots women's organizations, women farmers of what they're experiencing. And we're starting to now see the data and analysis and research actually being linked to that to the evidence that we have known as feminists and as activists for decades now of the way in which you see this happening in communities and in countries around the world. I don't know if any of my other colleagues wanted to come in on that point of the, you know, why this is a critical intersection um, uh, to be investing in in order to ensure uh, effective climate action, uh, as well as ensuring uh, gender equality more broadly or if anyone else wants, I didn't see anyone else raise their hand in the chat um, or add anything in the chat box itself, but we would welcome any other inputs. I saw one comment in the chat box that just inspired me. I thought maybe some of the, the other panelists would want to um, comment on it. And Lara, sorry, I know you have questions organized, but um, someone wrote in and said, I'm just a grandmother in a small hill town. What can I do? And I, I think that's such an inspiring um, question. And, and I'm so thrilled that this person has, has joined the discussion today um, and wanted to see if, if anyone wanted to respond to that in, in particular. Excellent. Did anyone want to respond to that? I'll work at an individual level. I can have a go while folks think about that. Oh, sorry. Go ahead, Maran. Oh, then I'll follow. I'll follow. Well, I was just going to say, I think one of the things that inspires me about this work is uplifting, is, is kind of doing, doing the work to see um, where inspiring action is happening and, and playing the role of, of, of uplifting that work. And so I think part of individual advocacy that can be done is seeking in your own community um, where there is action that is already happening and uplifting that, if not starting it yourself. Um, because I think that when, at least for me, what, what is helpful in terms of dealing with this, these multiple forms of crises um, is making sure I'm doing so in collective um, by finding, not trying to start something myself. Um, although I, I, of course, I know that folks around the world are doing incredible projects in their own communities, but I also recognize that there are advocacy networks that you can plug into, um, such as the one, you know, such as this Action Coalition. Um, and there are spaces and, and, and groups that are already working at this intersection that can be, that you can join and can be part of. And so, you know, my advice is typically to find, find your people, <laughs> find other people, whether that's in your community, at your community level, or um, at, at a larger level uh, in terms of perhaps you wanna get more engaged uh, in folks who are working in global processes, for example, that sometimes seems really daunting to do, but we've actually, I can speak for the women and gender constituency at the UN climate negotiations. We work really hard to make sure that that space is accessible to anybody who wants to get more involved and who just wants to follow the process of what's happening. Um, we welcome lots of people onto our calls there's no requirement of expertise necessary. It's really just a requirement of passion and commitment. Um, over to you. Oh, thanks. No, I, I, I was going to say that, uh, I think you already said a lot. Um, I just want to add by saying that I think I want to take this moment to really uh, give my gratitude to you. You are here, you know, even if you're in a small hill town, you are here. I don't know what time it is there for you. And, and besides all the advocacy work and all that, I think one of the really key elements I would like to say is that, that you already are doing it as being a grandmother. Uh, grandmothers are very special. <laughs> they make the best food. You are, you, uh, I mean, I think grandmothers are special because you, know, you have so much of knowledge of what used to be and how to do things and educating the young people like us. So I think uh, that is something um, you will always have above us. So I definitely feel that you still have a lot of knowledge 
um, giving it to your community or, or, or just giving it, it to your family. So I think uh, that in itself, sharing that knowledge, you know, we always talk about grandmothers are very special and, you know, you hear the stories and tales and, and some of that has like from my personal experience still is with me. I mean, say for example, looking at traditional medicine, I might go to the hospital, but the first remedy I will take is something that my grandmother told me. So I think um, you have a lot of knowledge and um, I think that is very special that you could share. And it could be about just life in of how to be a good person, um, respect. So I think um, I wouldn't say that what you can do, I think, I think in your own capacity you would be doing it. And it doesn't really matter whether you're in a small um, hill town or, or by a lake or a river or a big city. So I just wanted to take this opportunity to also, yeah, give my gratitude for you to being here it shows that you are also committed to following the international uh, discussions. So thank you from thank my you side. Thank you for that. I see we have one hand raised. Um, Mimi, is, is this, was this intentional this time? <laughs> You're still muted. Hi, thank you. Yes, the, the question, can you hear me now? Yes, we can hear you. Great, thanks for taking my question. Um, so coming more from an energy policy and law background, I find that often that's looked at in isolation from say environment and gender nexus. And um, be good just to hear if there's also more information on data on, on more of that, that combination, because obviously land and land rights are relevant to energy use and extraction. And, and, and it does often affect women and girls uh, disproportionately. That's a really excellent question. And I'm gonna pass over um, to, well, I'll open that up to any of my colleagues that might want to speak to that. I also just wanted to, because we're coming to a close uh, to the end of our chat here, um, I wanted to recognize there are other pieces, there are other questions in the chat in terms of um, policies that, how do we change attitudes in governments and societal attitudes to be able to change policy. There's also a flag of, um, of some water defenders in Honduras who are from Copin, from, um, from other colleagues that we are, we're connected to that are struggling right now. And if there's international efforts, um, I think that's something I, I can't speak to right now, but certainly that we thank you for flagging that so that we can um, see with our partners if there is some movement that is happening or that we can um, be part of. Um, and also just to say, I think and Mara, you can correct me, but I think we can also move this chat and share some of this into the, um, the pathable, I believe, um, space where we can share some of the links again. Um, but I wanna, I was wondering if Verania, maybe I could pass over to you to kind of close us out. If you wanted to speak at all to the energy nexus, you could, um, not to put you on the spot about that, but just to say that um, I do think that that's an area where, um, across the different actions that we have um, has been taken into account and working really hard to make sure, because you are correct, it often gets treated as a silo, um, that, that the gender energy climate nexus is a, is a key part of our work as well. But over to you, Brandon. Thank you, Bridget, and, and thank you, everyone. Uh, yeah, just, just briefly to, to say, so uh, yeah, definitely about the, the, the energy part. Well, it's, it's, it's one of the key uh, sectors that you know, has been uh, identified in pretty much every climate commitment uh, at the national level, but we need to definitely look at you know, the potential in terms of changing the patterns that we are seeing in terms of energy access, for instance, or also in, in terms of, um, of the representation of women in the energy sector uh, at different uh, levels, and particularly, you know, by shifting from, you know, the the, the fossil fuel-based uh, uh, energy matrix and the hope that is in terms of moving that path to a greener path and to generate green value change, how that will, you know, incorporate uh, women uh, in in a, in a uh, systematically and meaningful manner, and we cannot uh, think that we will um, that this will be, that this will be happening, you know, in 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 a direct uh, uh, manner if uh, programs and capacity are not specifically targeting 
uh, women. So definitely that's uh, an area where we need to, to focus. And so just quickly, you know, to say that, um, you know, so thank you everyone for joining the, the session and, and for your active participation. And, and we have heard of the relevance of these four areas in shaping climate action at the national, subnational and local levels. And, and we have also, you know, heard the need to scale up the good work taking place at the local level, make sure that these efforts influence and inform policy and institutional frameworks. You know, uh, we also heard about women's leadership at different levels from ministerial representation to social mobilization. Uh, there is progress there, but we need to speed up the pace. Uh, particularly when women still face remaining structural inequalities, such as women's right to land, a basic human right, as it was said, and that leads to economic empowerment, but also shift power dynamics overall. So it's crucial. Also, we heard about the relevance uh, of including new, um, or, or maybe not so new, but at least in terms of the approach, you know, of, uh, for instance, like GVV that are relevant to address increased risks due to the environmental uh, and climate stressors, the gender data collection, uh, collection and analysis, and the intersection with climate and environmental dimensions to, to make visible gender differentiated climate impacts, to increase cross-sectoral capacity, and to better address gender gaps. So um, just, just to say that, you know, Generation Equality Forum and the Feminist Action uh, for Climate Justice Action Coalition is, is not new in the sense of building broad alliances, but it is an opportunity today, a platform to strengthen interaction and collaboration, to share knowledge and relevance experiences, and to increase capacity for implementation for action. So I will welcome everybody, you know, to, to be very interested about uh, learning more and, and, and join uh, this uh, uh, broad uh, network. So I think that's, that's from my side for now. Thank you. And with that, I think we're at the end of our time. Mara has kindly posted in the chat that we can continue this discussion through the Pathable Online and CSW Forum space. We hope we can share all these links with you through that space. We'll investigate that and make sure we do. And we will share with you on that last note, um, the information that you need to become engaged in this action coalition. But thank you so much for your time. Thank you to all of our speakers for sharing their really valuable insights. And I wish you all a safe and healthy and happy day. Have a great day. Thank you. Thank you, everybody. All the best. Thanks, Thanks everyone. Thank you. Bye. Bye.